Hi there and welcome back. Today I will be talking about Allen Ginsberg and his epic uh, countercultural poem, Howl, and also uh, the rise of the counterculture and the beat generation in the United States and what effects it did have. So let's have a few bullet points about what was going on in the 1950s. It was a time of great economic and financial secure, uh, uh, prosperity after World War II. U.S. emerges as the only superpower. The rest of Europe is in shambles. Russia, although growing in power, certainly cannot match the economic might of the U.S. So the U.S. kind of turns inward upon itself to think about what it is. And for some, for some people, what it is is what it has always been. Um, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. Um, middle class, um, family oriented, but there is a growing new way of looking at American culture and America's destiny in the United States. And that is part of what we would call the counterculture. Um, people who are opening their minds through travel and through all kinds of other avenues to refashion what it means to be an American and what the vision of America should be. Now, some of this American counterculture comes against, um, comes from a very reactionary place or, or uh, comes from a very reactionary uh, government hunting out and trying to root out communists wherever they may be hiding. The Red Scare really made a lot of people um, fearful at the highest level of government, but also made lots of Americans in certain occupations, and that includes artists and teachers and activists mainly, um, feel very, very nervous because um, those three professional uh, and vocational sets were the ones that were often targeted um, as being communist. And some people were the mem were, were members of the communist American Communist Party, but doesn't mean that they were traitors. Um, I'm not going to go too deeply into um, the Committee of Anti-American Activities, um, spearheaded by Senator Joseph McCarthy, but what we do just need to know is that um, this committee would often present fraudulent evidence or not even show the evidence in order to try to get people to turn and name names. We know you're a communist, but we'll let you go if you tell us who else is. And either way, it was a really, really low point in American history, especially in the 20th century, to see Americans turn on each other like this. Now, a lot of the people in the counterculture were furious at this. Um, some of them may have been more sympathetic to communism, but not necessarily violent communism, a different form of government in which um, all people of a nation are provided for. Some of them may be more on the socialist spectrum, um, but they certainly did not believe in this proto-fascist um, witch hunting that happened in the 1950s. The B generation arises um, partly as a reaction to the American, uh, to um, the Anti-American uh, Activities Committee, but also out of many other artistic and social forces coming together at once. And one of those social forces is this merging of boundaries or this blending of boundaries between different aesthetics of different social and ethnic groups in the United States. Norman Mailer, who was a very, very important mid-century journalist and writer, wrote an essay called The White Negro, and basically talks about how the Beat Generation, uh, this collection of poets and artists and musicians um, who are really into jazz, would often find ways of incorporating other aesthetics, other ways of understanding music and literature and art into their own space, um, dismissing what we would call perhaps now square white culture. 
and the white negro is basically this term that norman mailer uses for the beat uh for the beat generation for people who might be called beatniks and for people that are countercultural and don't see their culture or what the ideal culture of america should be represented by strictly speaking white anglo-saxon protestant americans who are middle class the sexual revolution was also a really important part of the american calendar culture too um, the counterculture was far more accepting of homosexuality bisexuality um, trans people and that was a really important step forward too the, the counterculture and the beat generation helped make the hippie movement possible and, you know a lot of hippies went off the rails and i'm not going to pretend like they didn't but you know certain elements of that tradition and that movement are still with us today environmentalism um anti-slut shaming um anti-materialism all kinds of different social aspects that don't strict in that don't fit into the strict conformity of american culture um what else do i need to say about this uh, it's kind of rambly but we're going to keep going with it because it's about the 20th time i've started this so let's look at Allen Ginsberg, perhaps the best known member of the Beat Generation. What do we need to know about him? Look, there he is. This is a copyrighted picture, but you know what? Allen Ginsberg would be totally cool with me going ahead and using it anyway, because that's the kind of guy he was. He was very much a member of the counterculture. This is a wonderful picture. If you notice, he's sitting there. I believe this is at the New York Public Library underneath statues of homer and shakespeare and it looks like goethe right there too very literate very smart perhaps the most literary of that inner circle of beat nicks and beat poets well he's the son of progressive parents and they worked um in the labor movement for labor reform in order to help you know advocate for workers getting better working conditions maintaining a 40-hour work week, um, a livable wage, and so forth. And um, his mother was actually from the old country, too. Uh, she was an immigrant from Russia. And one of the best-known members of this beat generation, he was also palling around with other big names such as Jack Kerouac, which you might know from um, his uh, his road trip novel called On the Road, and William S. Barrows, who wrote uh, edgy and uh, experimental prose fiction such as Naked Lunch, but also other more uh, autobiographical accounts such as Junkie. Yeah, the uh, use of controlled substances was also part of the beat generation. Um, and there was, in some corners of the beat, beat movement, excess of these materials. Um, marijuana being perhaps the least uh, damaging of them. Psychedelics. Um, Hallucinatory agents were also really popular, such as LSD or acid, um, and more conventional or natural examples of those, uh, or incarnations of those kinds of substances, such as psilocybin mushrooms, um, peyote, ayahuasca, things of that nature. Um, and even though Allen Ginsberg started out as a really strong, heavy user of a lot of substances, he found that at, after a while, that kind of got in the way of him reaching a better literary and intellectual and spiritual space. And Whitman's voice is so powerful and so broad and so embracing that a lot of literary critics see him as, the, as a descendant of the American poetic voice, starting with Walt Whitman. And if you look at Walt Whitman's lines, you can see the kind of influence and similarity um, between his work and Allen Ginsberg's Howl.
And like his parents, he was very, very involved in social activism in the 60s. And this is where the Beat Generation starts to move into the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, women's rights movement. Some of the other Beats just kind of faded off and did their own thing. Kerouac did his own thing. Burroughs was a heroin addict, so he kind of retreated into his own world. But they left a... a a marked impression on American culture and, and the American literary scene. And Howell is seen as one of the most important poetic works of mid, mid 20th century, because it's, re, it's uh, expressing this countercultural um, scream of rage and despair and even though you're going to see a lot of similarity in like the length of the lines, that first section of Howell lists off a lot of unfortunate situations and grim imagery about how Americans are struggling. And that means Americans on the margins, Americans on the outside, Americans who did not want to buy into a very traditional lifestyle. Um, you will also see a lot of criticism of the military industrial complex and about and of corporate interference in general and we'll see that in that middle portion known as uh the moloch section moloch the eater of children and i've put a video in uh in in, in our work for this week of how of uh excuse me from metropolis the important uh, fritz lang movie of 1926 which names moloch now, Moloch is actually um, a demon mentioned in the Old Testament, but it's also been used to mean mechanical and financial forces that are eating away at a culture, eating its children. So this makes a lot of sense to Ginsburg. It's a really important part of the poem. And at the very, at the very end part, you do start to get that sense of a recovery and a renewal and a rebuilding in how but it really takes us through the underworld especially in that middle part who's also a bit of a performance artist and an activist and again this is part of the counterculture here um clothes were optional i think he's wearing a washcloth on his head anyway that's that and here are some of the other members of the movement here this is ginsburg when he's really young here's alan here's a uh, Bukowski, and over here is Kerouac. I believe that's Lawrence Ferlinghetti in the in the corner there. Oh, and here's Ferlinghetti, right here. Um, there they all are in front of City Lights Bookstore, which is one of the first places to publish Howl, and which where it was taken off the shelves because it was deemed obscene. And it does have some sexual reference in it. It's a lot more explicit than, say, Whitman's Song of Myself. Here's Ginsburg in the middle, kind of looking like a Jeff Goldblum there. Um, and we also see Kerouac in there and some of the others. Um, he was also Jewish, just like Jeff Goldblum. And and beatniks and the beat generation were all about performance and do-it-yourself art. So when you think about things like, say, poetry readings or poetry slams, a lot of that tradition comes in part out of the beat generation and the movement. So people getting crammed into tight cafes in the 50s and 60s, listening to people perform poetry, not just write things out and get it published, and somebody else see a book. There's a sense of immediacy and process in the beat generation that we sometimes don't see in other in other uh, poetic forms. And here's a really good line that I like from it. This is the very beginning of it. I saw my be the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo and the machinery of night. And again, you can feel that Whitmanian rhythm 
there. But notice there's a sense of desperation of being cornered in it that you don't see in Whitman's, uh, in Whitman's Song of Myself. We're running out of time right here. I'm going to stop it here and we'll continue on with another one in a second.